Chapter Fourteen of the Life and Adventures of Sir Lancelot Greaves. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jennifer Painter. The Life and Adventures of Sir Lancelot Greaves by Tobias Smollett. Chapter Fourteen which shows that a man cannot always sip when the cup is at his lip. Those who have felt the doubts, the jealousies, the resentments, the humiliations, the hopes, the despair, the impatience, and, in a word, the infinite disquiets of love, will be able to conceive the sea of agitation on which our adventurer was tossed all night long without repose or intermission. Sometimes he resolved to employ all his industry and address in discovering the place in which Aurelia was sequestered, that he might rescue her from the supposed restraint to which she had been subjected. But when his heart beat high with the anticipation of this exploit, he was suddenly invaded, and all his ardour checked, by the remembrance of that fatal letter written and signed by her own hand, which had divorced him from all hope, and first unsettled his understanding. The emotions waked by this remembrance were so strong that he leaped from the bed, and the fire being still burning in the chimney, lighted a candle, that he might once more banquet his spleen by reading the original billet, which, together with the ring he had received from Miss Darnell's mother, he kept in a small box, carefully deposited within his portmanteau. This being instantly unlocked, he unfolded the paper, and recited the contents in these words. Sir, obliged as I am by the passion you profess, and the eagerness with which you endeavour to give me the most convincing proof of your regard, I feel some reluctance in making you acquainted with a circumstance which in all probability you will not learn without some disquiet. But the affair is become so interesting, I am compelled to tell you, that however agreeable your proposals may have been to those whom I thought it my duty to please, by every reasonable concession, and howsoever you may have been flattered by the seeming complacency with which I have heard your addresses, I now find it absolutely necessary to speak in a decisive strain, to assure you that, without sacrificing my own peace, I cannot admit a continuation of your correspondence, and that your regard for me will be best shown by your desisting from a pursuit which is altogether inconsistent with the happiness of Aurelia Darnell. Having pronounced aloud the words that composed this dismission, he hastily replaced the cruel scroll, and being too well acquainted with a hand to harbour the least doubt of its being genuine, threw himself into his bed in a transport of despair, mingled with resentment, during the predominancy of which he determined to proceed in the career of adventure and endeavour to forget the unkindness of his mistress amidst the avocations of knight-errantry. Such was the resolution that governed his thoughts when he rose in the morning, ordered Crabshaw to saddle Bronzo Marte, and demanded a bill of his expense. Before these orders could be executed, the good woman of the house entering his apartment told him, with marks of concern, that the poor young lady, Miss Meadows, had dropped her pocket-book in the next chamber, where it was found by the hostess, who now presented it unopened. Our knight, having called in Mrs. Oakley and her son as witnesses, unfolded the book without reading one syllable of the contents, and found in it five banknotes, amounting to two hundred and thirty pounds. Perceiving at once the loss of this treasure might be attended with the most embarrassing consequences to the owner, and reflecting that this was a case which demanded the immediate interposition and assistance of chivalry, he declared that he himself 
would convey it safely into the hands of Miss Meadows, and desired to know the road she had pursued, that he might set out in quest of her without a moment's delay. It was not without some difficulty that this information was obtained from the postboy, who had been enjoined to secrecy by the lady, and even gratified with a handsome reward for his promised discretion. The same method was used to make him disgorge his trust. He undertook to conduct Sir Lancelot, who hired a post-chaise for despatch, and immediately departed, after having directed his squire to follow his track with the horses. Yet, whatever haste he made, it is absolutely necessary, for the reader's satisfaction, that we should outstrip the chaise, and visit the ladies before his arrival. We shall, therefore, without circumlocution, premise that Miss Meadows was no other than that paragon of beauty and goodness, the all-accomplished Miss Aurelia Darnell. She had, with that meekness of resignation peculiar to herself, for some years, submitted to every species of oppression which her uncle's tyranny of disposition could plan, and his unlimited power of guardianship execute, till at length it rose to such a pitch of despotism as she could not endure. He had projected a match between his niece and one Philip Sycamore, Esquire, a young man who possessed a pretty considerable estate in the North Country, who liked Aurelia's person, but was enamoured of her fortune, and had offered to purchase Anthony's interest and alliance with certain concessions, which could not but be agreeable to a man of loose principles, who would have found it a difficult task to settle the accounts of his wardship. According to the present estimate of matrimonial felicity, Sycamore might have found admittance as a future son-in-law to any private family of the kingdom. He was by birth a gentleman, tall, straight, and muscular, with a fair, sleek, unmeaning face that promised more simplicity than ill-nature. His education had not been neglected, and he inherited an estate of five thousand a year. Miss Darnell, however, had penetration enough to discover and despise him as a strange composition of rapacity and profusion, absurdity and good sense, bashfulness and impudence, self-conceit and diffidence, awkwardness and ostentation, insolence and good nature, rashness and timidity. He was continually surrounded and preyed upon by certain vermin called lead captains and buffoons, who showed him in leading strings like a sucking giant, rifled his pockets without ceremony, ridiculed him to his face, traduced his character, and exposed him in a thousand ludicrous attitudes for the diversion of the public. While at the same time he knew their knavery, saw their drift, detested their morals, and despised their understanding. He was so infatuated by indolence of thought and communication with folly that he would have rather suffered himself to be led into a ditch with company than be at the pains of going over a bridge alone, and involved himself in a thousand difficulties, the natural consequences of an error in the first concoction which, though he plainly saw it, he had not resolution enough to avoid. Such was the character of Squire Sycamore, who professed himself the rival of Sir Lancelot Greaves in the good graces of Miss Aurelia Darnell. He had in this pursuit persevered with more constancy and fortitude than he ever exerted in any other instance. Being generally needy from extravagance, he was stimulated by his wants, and animated by his vanity, which was artfully instigated by his followers, who hoped to share the spoils of his success. These motives were reinforced by the incessant and eager exhortations of Anthony Darnell, who, seeing his ward in the last year of her minority, thought there was no time to be lost in securing his own indemnification, 
and snatching his niece for ever from the hopes of Sir Lancelot, whom he now hated with redoubled animosity. Finding Aurelia deaf to all his remonstrances, proof against ill usage, and resolutely averse to the proposed union with Sycamore, he endeavoured to detach her thoughts from Sir Lancelot, by forging tales to the prejudice of his constancy and moral character, and finally, by recapitulating the proofs and instances of his distraction, which he particularised with the most malicious exaggerations. In spite of all his arts, he found it impracticable to surmount her objections to the proposed alliance, and therefore changed his battery. Instead of transferring her to the arms of his friend, he resolved to detain her in his own power by a legal claim, which would invest him with the uncontrolled management of her affairs. This was a charge of lunacy, in consequence of which he hoped to obtain a commission, to secure a jury to his wish, and be appointed sole committee of her person, as well as steward on her estate, of which he would then be heir apparent. As the first steps towards the execution of this honest scheme, he had subjected Aurelia to the superintendency and direction of an old duenna, who had been formerly the procuress of his pleasures, and hired a new set of servants, who were given to understand, at their first admission, that the young lady was disordered in her brain. An impression of this nature is easily preserved among servants, when the master of the family thinks his interest is concerned in supporting the imposture. The melancholy produced from her confinement, and the vivacity of her resentment under ill usage, were, by the address of Antony, and the prepossession of his domestics, perverted into the effects of insanity, and the same interpretation was strained upon her most indifferent words and actions. The tidings of Miss Darnell's disorder was carefully circulated in whispers, and soon reached the ears of Mr. Sycamore, who was not at all pleased with the information. From his knowledge of Anthony's disposition, he suspected the truth of the report, and, unwilling to see such a prize, ravished as it were from his grasp, he, with the advice and assistance of his myrmidons, resolved to set the captive at liberty, in full hope of turning the adventure to his own advantage. For he argued in this manner. If she is in fact compos mentis, her gratitude will operate in my behalf, and even prudence will advise her to embrace the proffered asylum from the villainy of her uncle. If she is really disordered, it will be no great difficulty to deceive her into marriage, and then I become her trustee, of course. The plan was well conceived, but Sycamore had not discretion enough to keep his own counsel. From weakness and vanity he blabbed the design, which in a little time was communicated to Anthony Darnell, and he took his precautions accordingly. Being infirm in his own person, and consequently unfit for opposing the violence of some desperadoes, whom he knew to be the satellites of Sycamore, he prepared a private retreat for his ward at the house of an old gentleman, a companion of his youth, whom he had imposed upon with the infiction of her being disordered in her understanding, and amused with the story of a dangerous design upon her person. Thus cautioned and instructed, the gentleman had gone with his own coach and servants to receive Aurelia and her governant at a third house, to which she had been privately removed from her uncle's habitation. And in this journey it was that she had been so accidentally protected from the violence of the robbers by the interposition and prowess of our adventurer. As he did not wear his helmet in that exploit, she recognised his features as he passed the coach, and struck with the apparition, shrieked aloud. She had been assured by her guardian that his design was to convey her to her own house, but perceiving in the sequel that the carriage struck off upon a different road, 
and finding herself in the hands of strangers, she began to dread a much more disagreeable fate, and conceived doubts and ideas that filled her tender heart with horror and affliction. When she expostulated with the duenna, she was treated like a changeling, admonished to be quiet, and reminded that she was under the direction of those who would manage her with a tender regard to her own welfare and the honour of her family. When she addressed herself to the old gentleman, who was not much subject to the emotions of humanity, and besides firmly persuaded that she was deprived of her reason, he made no answer, but laid his finger on his mouth by way of enjoining silence. This mysterious behaviour aggravated the fears of the poor, hapless young lady, and her terrors waxed so strong that when she saw Tom Clark, whose face she knew, she called aloud for assistance, and even pronounced the name of his patron, Sir Lancelot Greaves, which she imagined might stimulate him the more to attempt something for her deliverance. The reader has already been informed in what manner the endeavours of Tom and his uncle miscarried. Miss Darnell's new keeper, having in the course of his journey halted for refreshment at the Black Lion, of which being landlord, he believed the good woman and her family were entirely devoted to his will and pleasure. Aurelia found an opportunity of speaking in private to Dolly, who had a very prepossessing appearance. She conveyed a purse of money into the hands of this young woman, telling her, while the tears trickled down her cheeks, that she was a young lady of fortune, in danger, as she apprehended, of assassination. This hint, which she communicated in a whisper, while the governant stood at the other end of the room, was sufficient to interest the compassionate Dolly in her behalf. As soon as the coach departed, she made her mother acquainted with the transaction, and as they naturally concluded that the young lady expected their assistance, they resolved to approve themselves worthy of her confidence. Dolly having enlisted in their design a trusty countryman, one of her own professed admirers, they set out together for the house of the gentleman in which the fair prisoner was confined, and waited for her in secret at the end of a pleasant park, in which they naturally concluded she might be indulged with the privilege of taking the air. The event justified their conception. On the very first day of their watch they saw her approach, accompanied by her duenna. Dolly and her attendant immediately tied their horses to a stake and retired into a thicket, which Aurelia did not fail to enter. Dolly forthwith appeared, and taking her by the hand, led her to the horses, one of which she mounted in the utmost hurry and trepidation, while the countryman bound the duenna with a cord prepared for the purpose, gagged her mouth, and tied her to a tree, where he left her to her own meditations. Then he mounted before Dolly, and through unfrequented paths conducted his charge to an inn on the post-road, where a chaise was ready for their reception. As he refused to proceed farther, lest his absence from his own home should create suspicion, Aurelia rewarded him liberally, but would not part with her faithful Dolly, who indeed had no inclination to be discharged. Such an affection and attachment had she already acquired for the amiable fugitive, though she knew neither her story nor her true name. Aurelia thought proper to conceal both and assumed the fictitious appellation of Meadows, until she should be better acquainted with the disposition and discretion of her new attendant. The first resolution she could take, in the present flutter of her spirits, was to make the best of her way to London, where she thought she might find an asylum in the house of a female relation, married to an eminent physician, known by the name of Quardle. In the execution of this hasty resolve, she travelled at a violent rate, from stage to stage, in a carriage drawn by four horses, without halting for necessary refreshment or repose, until she judged herself out of danger of being overtaken. 
as she appeared overwhelmed with grief and consternation the good-natured dolly endeavoured to alleviate her distress with diverting discourse and among other less interesting stories entertained her with the adventures of sir launcelot and captain crow which she had seen and heard recited while they remained at the black lion nor did she fail to introduce mr thomas clark in her narrative with such a favourable representation of his person and character as plainly discovered that her own heart had received a rude shock from the irresistible force of his qualifications the history of sir launcelot greaves was a theme which effectually fixed the attention of aurelia distracted as her ideas must have been by the circumstance of her present situation the particulars of his conduct since the correspondence between him and her had ceased she heard with equal concern and astonishment for how far soever she deemed herself detached from all possibility of future connection with that young gentleman she was not made of such indifferent stuff as to learn without emotion the calamitous disorder of an accomplished youth whose extraordinary virtues she could not but revere as they had deviated from the post-road taken precautions to conceal their route and made such progress that they were now within one day's journey of london the careful and affectionate dolly seeing her dear lady quite exhausted with fatigue used all her natural rhetoric which was very powerful mingled with tears that flowed from the heart in persuading aurelia to enjoy some repose and so far she succeeded in the attempt that for one night the toil of travelling was intermitted this recess from incredible fatigue was a pause that afforded our adventurer time to overtake them before they reached the metropolis that vast labyrinth in which aurelia might have been for ever lost to his inquiry it was in the afternoon of the day which succeeded his departure from the white hart that sir launcelot arrived at the inn where miss aurelia darnell had bespoke a dish of tea and a post-chaise for the next stage he had by inquiry traced her a considerable way without ever dreaming who the person really was whom he thus pursued and now he desired to speak with her attendant dolly was not a little surprised to see sir launcelot greaves of whose character she had conceived a very sublime idea from the narrative of mr thomas clark but she was still more surprised when he gave her to understand that he had charged himself with a pocket-book containing the bank-notes which miss meadows had dropped in the house where they had been threatened with insult miss darnell had not yet discovered her disaster when her attendant running into the apartment presented the prize which she had received from our adventurer with his compliments to miss meadows implying a request to be admitted into her presence that he might make a personal tender of his best services it is not to be supposed that the amiable aurelia heard unmoved such a message from a person whom her maid discovered to be the identical sir launcelot greaves whose story she had so lately related but as the ensuing scene requires fresh attention in the reader we shall defer it till another opportunity when his spirits shall be recruited from the fatigue of this chapter end of chapter fourteen Chapter Fifteen of the Life and Adventures of Sir Launcelot Greaves. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jennifer Painter. The Life and Adventures of Sir Launcelot Greaves by Tobias Smollett. Chapter Fifteen Exhibiting an Interview which it is to be hoped will interest the curiosity of the reader the mind of the delicate aurelia was strangely agitated by the intelligence which she received with her pocket-book from dolly confounded as she was 
by the nature of her situation, she at once perceived that she could not, with any regard to the dictates of gratitude, refuse complying with the request of Sir Launcelot. But, in the first hurry of her emotion, she directed Dolly to beg, in her name, that she might be excused for wearing a mask at the interview which he desired, as she had particular reasons, which concerned her peace, for retaining that disguise. Our adventurer submitted to this preliminary with a good grace, as he had nothing in view but the injunction of his order and the duties of humanity, and he was admitted without further preamble. When he entered the room, he could not help being struck with the presence of Aurelia. Her stature was improved since he had seen her, her shape was exquisitely formed, and she received him with an air of dignity which impressed him with a very sublime idea of her person and character. She was no less affected at the sight of our adventurer, who, though cased in armour, appeared with his head uncovered, and the exercise of travelling had thrown such a glow of health and vivacity on his features, which were naturally elegant and expressive, that we will venture to say there was not in all England a couple that excelled this amiable pair in personal beauty and accomplishments. Aurelia shone with all the fabled graces of nymph or goddess, and to Sir Launcelot might be applied what the divine poet Ariosto said of the Prince Zerbino, Natura il fece e poi rupe la stampa, where nature stamped him, she the die destroyed. Our adventurer, having made his obeisance to this supposed Miss Meadows, told her, with an air of pleasantry, that although he thought himself highly honoured in being admitted to her presence, as superior beings are adored unseen, yet his pleasure would receive a very considerable addition if she would be pleased to withdraw that invidious veil, that he might have a glimpse of the divinity which it concealed. Aurelia immediately took off her mask, saying with a faltering accent, I cannot be so ungrateful as to deny such a small favour to a gentleman who has laid me under the most important obligations. The unexpected apparition of Miss Aurelia Darnell, beaming with all the emanations of ripened beauty, blushing with all the graces of the most lovely confusion, could not but produce a violent effect upon the mind of Sir Launcelot Greaves. He was indeed overwhelmed with a mingled transport of astonishment, admiration, affection, and awe. The colour vanished from his cheeks, and he stood gazing upon her in silence, with the most emphatic expression of countenance. Aurelia was infected by his disorder. She began to tremble, and the roses fluctuated on her face. "'I cannot forget,' said she, "'that I owe my life to the courage and humanity of Sir Launcelot Greaves, "'and that he at the same time rescued from the most dreadful death "'a dear and venerable parent.' "'Would to heaven she still survived!' cried our adventurer with great emotion she was the friend of my youth the kind patroness of my felicity my guardian angel forsook me when she expired her last injunctions are deep engraver on my heart while he pronounced these words she lifted her handkerchief to her fair eyes and after some pause proceeded in a tremulous tone i hope sir I hope you have... I should be sorry. Pardon me, sir, I cannot reflect upon such an interesting subject unmoved. Here she fetched a deep sigh that was accompanied by a flood of tears, while the knight continued to bend his eye upon her with the utmost eagerness of attention. Having recollected herself a little, she endeavoured to shift the conversation, you have been abroad since I had the pleasure to see you. I hope you were agreeably amused in your travels. 
"'No, madam,' said our hero, drooping his head, "'I have been unfortunate.' When she, with the most enchanting sweetness of benevolence, expressed her concern to hear he had been unhappy, and her hope that his misfortunes were not past remedy, he lifted up his eyes, and fixing them upon her again, with a look of tender dejection, "'Cut off,' said he, "'from the possession of what my soul held most dear, "'I wished for death, and was visited by distraction. "'I have been abandoned by my reason. "'My youth is for ever blasted.' "'The tender heart of Aurelia could bear no more. "'Her knees began to totter, "'the lustre vanished from her eyes, "'and she fainted in the arms of her attendant.' Sir Lancelot, aroused by this circumstance, assisted Dolly in seating her mistress on a couch, where she soon recovered, and saw the knight on his knees before her. "'I am still happy,' said he, "'in being able to move your compassion, though I have been held unworthy of your esteem.' "'Do me justice,' she replied. "'My best esteem—' has been always inseparably connected with the character of Sir Lancelot Greaves. "'Is it possible?' cried our hero. "'Then surely I have no reason to complain. "'If I have moved your compassion and possess your esteem, "'I am but one degree short of supreme happiness. "'That, however, is a gigantic step. "'Oh, Miss Darnell, when I remember that dear that melancholy moment. So saying, he gently touched her hand in order to press it to his lips, and perceived on her finger the very individual ring which he had presented in her mother's presence as an interchanged testimony of plighted faith. Starting at the well-known object, the sight of which conjured up a strange confusion of ideas, This, said he, was once the pledge of something still more cordial than esteem. Aurelia, blushing at this remark, while her eyes lightened with unusual vivacity, replied in a severer tone, Sir, you best know how it lost its original signification. By heaven I do not, madam, exclaimed our adventurer. With me it was ever held a sacred idea throned within my heart, cherished with such fervency of regard, with such reverence of affection, as the devout anchorite more unreasonably pays to those sainted relics that constitute the object of his adoration. And, like those relics, answered Miss Darnell, I have been insensible of my votary's devotion. A saint I must have been, or something more, to know the sentiments of your heart by inspiration. Did I forbear, said he, to express, to repeat, to enforce the dictates of the purest passion that ever warmed the human breast, until I was denied access, and formally discarded by that cruel dismission? I must beg your pardon, sir, cried Aurelia, interrupting him hastily. I know not what you mean. That fatal sentence, said he, if not pronounced by your own lips, at least written by your own fair hand, which drove me out in exile for ever from the paradise of your affection. I would not, she replied, do Sir Lancelot grieves the injury to suppose him capable of imposition, but you talk of things to which I am an utter stranger. I have a right, sir, to demand of your honour that you will not impute to me your breaking off a connection which I would rather wish had never— Heaven and earth, what do I hear? cried our impatient knight. Have I not the baleful letter to produce? What else but Miss Darnell's explicit and express declaration could have destroyed the sweetest hope that ever cheered my soul, could have obliged me to resign all claim to that felicity for which alone I wished to live, could have filled my bosom with unutterable sorrow and despair, could have even divested me of reason, and driven me from the society of men 
a poor forlorn wandering lunatic such as you see me now prostrate at your feet all the blossoms of my youth withered all the honours of my family decayed aurelia looking wishfully at her lover sir said she you overwhelm me with amazement and anxiety you are imposed upon if you have received any such letter you are deceived if you thought aurelia darnell could be so insensible ungrateful and inconstant this last word she pronounced with some hesitation and a downcast look while her face underwent a total suffusion and the knight's heart began to palpitate with all the violence of emotion he eagerly imprinted a kiss upon her hand exclaiming in interrupted phrase can it be possible heaven grant sure this is no illusion oh madam shall i call you my aurelia my heart is bursting with a thousand fond thoughts and presages you shall see that dire paper which has been the source of all my woes it is the constant companion of my travels last night i nourished my chagrin with the perusal of its horrid contents aurelia expressed great impatience to view the cruel forgery for such she assured him it must be but he could not gratify her desire till the arrival of his servant with the portmanteau in the meantime tea was called the lovers were seated he looked and languished she flushed and faltered all was doubt and delirium fondness and flutter their mutual disorder communicated itself to the kind-hearted sympathizing dolly who had been witness to the interview and deeply affected at the disclosure of the scene unspeakable was her surprise when she found her mistress miss meadows was no other than the celebrated aurelia darnell whose eulogium she had heard so eloquently pronounced by her sweetheart mr thomas clark a discovery which still more endeared her lady to her affection she had wept plentifully at the progress of their mutual explanation and was now so disconcerted that she scarce knew the meaning of the orders she had received she set the kettle on the table and placed the tea-board on the fire her confusion by attracting the notice of her mistress helped to relieve her from her own embarrassing situation she with her own delicate hands rectified the mistake of dolly who still continued to sob and said you may think my lady darnell as how i've eaten no cheese but y ain't so i think for my part as i've been bewitched sir lancelot could not help smiling at the simplicity of dolly whose goodness of heart and attachment aurelia did not fail to extol as soon as her back was turned it was in consequence of this commendation that the next time she entered the room our adventurer for the first time considered her face and seemed to be struck with her features he asked her some questions which she could not answer to his satisfaction applauded her regard for her lady and assured her of his friendship and protection he now begged to know the cause that obliged his aurelia to travel at such a rate and in such an equipage and she informed him of those particulars which we have already communicated to our reader sir lancelot glowed with resentment when he understood how his dear aurelia had been oppressed by her perfidious and cruel guardian he bit his nether lip rolled his eyes around started from his seat and striding across the room i remember said he the dying words of her who now is a saint in heaven that violent man my brother-in-law who is aurelia's sole guardian will thwart her wishes with every obstacle that brutal resentment and implacable malice can contrive what followed it would ill become me to repeat but she concluded with these words the rest we must leave to the dispensations of providence 
was it not providence that sent me hither to guard and protect the injured aurelia then turning to miss darnell whose eyes streamed with tears he added yes divine creature heaven careful of your safety and in compassion to my sufferings hath guided me hither in this mysterious manner that i might defend you from violence and enjoy this transition from madness to deliberation from despair to felicity so saying he approached this amiable mourner this fragrant flower of beauty glittering with the dewdrops of the morning this sweetest and gentlest loveliest ornament of human nature he gazed upon her with looks of love ineffable he sat down by her he pressed her soft hand in his he began to fear that all he saw was the flattering vision of a distempered brain he looked and sighed and turning up his eyes to heaven breathed in broken murmurs the chaste raptures of his soul the tenderness of this communication was too painful to be long endured aurelia industriously interposed other subjects of discourse that his attention might not be dangerously overcharged and the afternoon passed insensibly away though he had determined in his own mind never more to quit this idol of his soul they had not yet concerted any plan of conduct when their happiness was all at once interrupted by a repetition of cries denoting horror and a servant coming in said he believed some rogues were murdering a traveller on the highway the supposition of such distress operated like gunpowder on the disposition of our adventurer who without considering the situation of aurelia and indeed without seeing or being capable to think on her or any other subject for the time being ran directly to the stable and mounting the first horse which he found saddled issued out in the twilight having no other weapon but his sword he rode full speed to the spot where the cries seemed to proceed but they sounded more remote as he advanced nevertheless he followed them to a considerable distance from the road over fields ditches and hedges and at last came so near that he could plainly distinguish the voice of his own squire timothy crabshaw bellowing for mercy with hideous vociferation stimulated by this recognition he redoubled his career in the dark till at length his horse plunged into a hole the nature of which he could not comprehend but he found it impracticable to disengage him it was with some difficulty that he himself clambered over a ruined wall and regained the open ground here he groped about in the utmost impatience of anxiety ignorant of the place mad with vexation for the fate of his unfortunate squire and between whiles invaded with a pang of concern for aurelia left among strangers unguarded and alarmed in the midst of this emotion he bethought himself of hallooing aloud that in case he should be in the neighbourhood of any inhabited place he might be heard and assisted he accordingly practised this expedient which was not altogether without effect for he was immediately answered by an old friend no other than his own steed bronza marte who hearing his master's voice neighed strenuously at a small distance the knight being well acquainted with the sound heard it with astonishment and advancing in the right direction found his noble charger fastened to a tree he forthwith untied and mounted him then laying the reins upon his neck allowed him to choose his own path in which he began to travel with equal steadiness and expedition they had not proceeded far when the knight's ears were again saluted by the cries of crabshaw which bronza marty no sooner heard than he pricked up his ears neighed and quickened his pace as if he had been sensible of the squire's distress and hastened to his relief sir lancelot notwithstanding his own disquiet could not help observing 
and admiring this generous sensibility of his horse. He began to think himself some hero of romance, mounted upon a winged steed, inspired with reason, directed by some humane enchanter, who pitied virtue in distress. All circumstances considered, it is no wonder that the commotion in the mind of our adventurer produced some such delirium. All night he continued the chase. The voice, which was repeated at intervals, still retreating before him, till the morning began to appear in the east, when, by divers piteous groans, he was directed to the corner of a wood, where he beheld his miserable squire stretched upon the grass, and Gilbert feeding by him, altogether unconcerned, the helmet and the lance suspended at the saddle-bow, and the portmanteau safely fixed upon the crupper. The knight, riding up to Crabshaw, with equal surprise and concern, asked what had brought him there, and Timothy, after some pause, during which he surveyed his master with a rueful aspect, answered, "'The devil!' "'One would imagine, indeed, you had some such conveyance,' said Sir Lancelot. "'I have followed your cries since last evening. I know not how nor whither, and never could come up with you till this moment. But say, what damage have you sustained, that you lie in that wretched posture, and groan so dismally?' "'I can't guess,' replied the squire. "'Faint that my old carcass is drilled into oilet holes, "'and my flesh pinched into a jelly.' "'How? Wherefore?' cried the knight. "'Who were the miscreants that treated you in such a barbarous manner? "'Do you know the ruffians?' "'I know nothing at all,' answered the peevish squire, "'but that I was tormented by viva hundred and viva thousand legions of devils, "'and there's an end it. "'Well, you must have a little patience, Crabshaw. "'There is a salve for every sore. "'You might as well tell me, for every sow there is a reverence. "'For a man in your condition, methinks you talk very much at your ease. "'Try if you can get up and mount Gilbert, "'that you may be conveyed to some place where you can have proper assistance. "'So, well done. Cheerly.' "'Timothy actually made an effort to rise, but fell down again.' and uttered a dismal yell. Then his master exhorted him to take advantage of a park wall, by which he lay, and raise himself gradually upon it. Crabshaw, eyeing him askance, said, by way of reproach, for his not alighting and assisting him in person, "'That's your house with it, and you'll have more teachers than reachers.' Having pronounced this inelegant adage, he made shift to stand upon his legs, and now, the knight lending a hand, was mounted upon Gilbert, though not without a world of O's and R's and other ejaculations of pain and impatience. As they jogged on together, our adventurer endeavoured to learn the particulars of the disaster which had befallen the squire, but all the information he could obtain amounted to a very imperfect sketch of the adventure. By dint of a thousand interrogations, he understood that Crabshaw had been, in the preceding evening, encountered by three persons on horseback, with Venetian masks on their faces, which he mistook for their natural features, and was terrified accordingly. That they not only presented pistols to his breast, and led his horse out of the highway, but pricked him with goads, and pinched him, from time to time, till he screamed with the torture, that he was led through unfrequented places across the country, sometimes at an easy trot, sometimes at full gallop, and tormented all night by those hideous demons, who vanished at daybreak, and left him lying on the spot where he was found by his master. This was a mystery which our hero could by no means unriddle. It was the more unaccountable, as the squire had not been robbed of his money, horses, and baggage. He was even disposed to believe that Crabshaw's brain was disordered, and the whole account he had given no more than a mere chimera. This opinion, however, he could no longer retain, when he arrived at an inn on the post-road, and found, upon examination, that Timothy's lower extremities were covered with blood, 
and all the rest of his body speckled with livid marks of contusion. But he was still more chagrined when the landlord informed him that he was thirty miles distant from the place where he had left Aurelia, and that his way lay through crossroads, which were almost impassable at that season of the year. Alarmed at this intelligence, he gave directions that his squire should be immediately conveyed to bed in a comfortable chamber, as he complained more and more, and, indeed, was seized with a fever, occasioned by the fatigue, the pain, and terror he had undergone. A neighbouring apothecary being called, and giving it as his opinion that he could not for some days be in a condition to travel, his master deposited a sum of money in his hands, desiring he might be properly attended till he should hear further. Then mounting Bronza Marte, he set out with a guide for the place he had left, not without a thousand fears and perplexities, arising from the reflection of having left the jewel of his heart with such precipitation. End of chapter 15Chapter 16 of the Life and Adventures of Sir Lancelot Greaves. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jennifer Painter. The Life and Adventures of Sir Lancelot Greaves by Tobias Smollett. Chapter 16. Which, it is to be hoped, the reader will find an agreeable medley of mirth and madness, sense and absurdity. It was not without reason that our adventurer afflicted himself. His fears were but too prophetic. When he alighted at the inn, which he had left so abruptly the preceding evening, he ran directly to the apartment where he had been so happy in Aurelia's company. But her he saw not. All was solitary. Turning to the woman of the house, who had followed him into the room, "'Where is the lady?' cried he, in a tone of impatience. Mine hostess, screwing up her features into a very demure aspect, said she saw so many ladies she could not pretend to know who he meant. "'I tell thee, woman,' exclaimed the knight, in a louder accent, "'thou never sawest such another. I mean that miracle of beauty.' "'Very like.' replied the dame, as she retired to the room door. "'Husband, here's one as axes concerning a miracle of beauty. Hi, hi, hi! Can you give him any information about this miracle of beauty? Oh, la! Hi, hi, hi!' Instead of answering this question, the innkeeper advancing and surveying Sir Lancelot, "'Friend,' said he, "'you are the person that carried off my horse out of the stable. "'Tell me not of a horse. Where is the young lady?' now i will tell you of the horse and i'll make you find him too before you and i part wretched animal how darest thou dally with my impatience speak or despair what is become of miss meadows say did she leave this place of her own accord or was she her uh, speak answer or by the powers above i'll answer you flat she you call miss meadows is in very good hands so you may make yourself easy on that score. Sacred heaven! Explain your meaning, miscreant, or I'll make you a dreadful example to all the insolent publicans of the realm. So saying, he seized him with one hand and dashed him on the floor, set one foot on his belly, and kept him trembling in that prostrate attitude. The ostler and waiter, flying to the assistance of their master, our adventurer unsheathed his sword, declaring he would dismiss their souls from their bodies, and exterminate the whole family from the face of the earth, if they would not immediately give him the satisfaction he required. The hostess, being by this time terrified almost out of her senses, fell on her knees before him, begging he would spare their lives, and promising to declare the whole truth. He would not, however, remove his foot from the body of her husband until she told him that in less than half an hour after he had sallied out upon the supposed robbers, two chaises arrived, 
each drawn by four horses, that two men, armed with pistols, alighted from one of them, laid violent hands upon the young lady, and, notwithstanding her struggling and shrieking, forced her into the other carriage, in which was an infirm gentleman, who called himself her guardian, that the maid was left to the care of a third servant, to follow with a third chaise, which was got ready with all possible dispatch, while the other two proceeded at full speed on the road to London. It was by this communicative lackey the people of the house were informed that the old gentleman his master was Squire Darnell, the young lady his niece and ward, and our adventurer a needy sharper who wanted to make a prey of her fortune. The knight, fired even almost to frenzy by this intimation, spurned the carcass of his host, and, his eye gleaming terror, rushed into the yard, in order to mount Bronza Marte and pursue the ravisher, when he was diverted from his purpose by a new incident. One of the postillions, who had driven the chaise in which Dolly was conveyed, happened to arrive at that instant, when, seeing our hero, he ran up to him cap in hand, and, presenting a letter, accosted him in these words, "'Please your noble honour, if your honour be Sir Lancelot Greaves of the West Riding, here's a letter from a gentlewoman that I promised to deliver into your honour's own hands.' The knight, snatching the letter with the utmost avidity, broke it up, and found the contents couched in these terms. "'Honoured, sir!' The man as gin me lead to let you know my dear lady is going to London with her uncle Squire Darnell. Be not concerned, honoured sir, for I take it on my life to let you know where's we be settled, if so I can find where you lodge in London. The man says you may put it in the public prints. I hope the bear here will be honest enough to deliver this scroll and that your honour will pardon your humble servant to command. Dorothy Cowslip. P.S. Please my cane service to lay a clerk. Squire Darnell's man is very civil for certain, but I've no thoughts on him, I assure ye. Marry hap, worse where may have a better chat, as the saying goes. Nothing could be more seasonable than the delivery of this billet, which he had no sooner perused, than his reflection returned, and he entered into a serious deliberation with his own heart. He considered that Aurelia was by this time far beyond a possibility of being overtaken, and that by a precipitate pursuit he should only expose his own infirmities. He confided in the attachment of his mistress, and in the fidelity of her maid, who would find opportunities of communicating her sentiments by means of this lackey, of whom he perceived by the letter she had already made a conquest. He therefore resolved to bridle his impatience, to proceed leisurely to London, and, instead of taking any rash step which might induce Antony Darnell to remove his niece from that city, remain in seeming quiet until she should be settled, and her guardian return to the country. Aurelia had mentioned to him the name of Dr. Cordell, and from him he expected in due time to receive the most interesting information, formerly tormented with the pangs of despairing love, which had actually unsettled his understanding. He was now happily convinced that he had inspired the tender breast of Aurelia with mutual affection, and though she was invidiously snatched from his embrace in the midst of such endearments as had wound up his soul to ecstasy and transport, he did not doubt of being able to rescue her from the power of an inhumane kinsman whose guardianship would soon of course expire, and in the meantime he rested with the most perfect dependence on her constancy and virtue. As he next day crossed the country, ruminating on the disaster that had befallen his squire, and could now compare circumstances coolly, he easily comprehended the whole scheme of that adventure, which was no other than an artifice of Anthony Darnell and his emissaries to draw him from the inn, where he proposed to execute his design upon the innocent Aurelia. He took it for granted that the uncle, 
having been made acquainted with his niece's elopement, had followed her track by the help of such information as he received from one stage to another, and that, receiving more particulars at the White Hart touching Sir Lancelot, he had formed the scheme in which Crabshaw was an involuntary instrument towards the seduction of his master. Amusing himself with these and other cogitations, our hero in the afternoon reached the place of his destination, and, entering the inn where Timothy had been left at sick quarters, chanced to meet the apothecary retiring precipitately in a very unsavoury pickle from the chamber of his patient. When he inquired about the health of his squire, this retainer to medicine, wiping himself all the while with a napkin, answered in manifest confusion that he apprehended him to be in a very dangerous way from an inflammation of the pia mater which had produced a most furious delirium. Then he proceeded to explain, in technical terms, the method of cure he had followed, and concluded with telling him the poor squire's brain was so outrageously disordered that he had rejected all administration and just thrown a urinal in his face. The knight's humanity, being alarmed at this intelligence, he resolved that Crabshaw should have the benefit of further advice, and asked if there was not a physician in the place. The apothecary, after some interjections of hesitation, owned there was a doctor in the village, an odd sort of a humorist, but he believed he had not much to do in the way of his profession, and was not much used to the forms of prescription. He was counted a scholar, to be sure, but as to his medical capacity, he would not take upon him to say. "'No matter,' cried Sir Lancelot. "'He may strike out some lucky thought for the benefit of the patient, and I desire you will call him instantly.' While the apothecary was absent on this service, our adventurer took it in his head to question the landlord about the character of this physician, which had been so unfavourably represented, and received the following information. "'For my part, master, I know nothing amiss of the doctor. He's a quiet sort of an inoffensive man, uses my house sometime, and pays for what he has, like the rest of my customers. They say he deals very little in physic stuff, but he cures his patients with fasting and water gruel, whereby he can't expect the apothecary to be his friend.' "'You knows, master, one must live and let live, as the saying is. "'I must say, he, for the value of three guineas, "'set up my wife's constitution in such a manner "'that I have saved within these two years, I believe, forty pounds in apothecary's bills. "'But what of that? "'Every man must eat, though at another's expense, "'and I should be in a deadly hole myself "'if all my customers should take it in their heads "'to drink nothing but water gruel because it's good for the constitution. Thank God, I have as good a constitution as e'er a man in England, but for all that, I and my old family bleed and purge, and take a diet drink twice a year, by way of serving the apothecary, who is a very honest man, and a very good neighbour. Their conversation was interrupted by the return of the apothecary with the doctor, who had very little of the faculty in his appearance. He was dressed remarkably plain, seemed to be turned of fifty, had a careless air, and a sarcastical turn in his countenance. Before he entered the sick man's chamber, he asked some questions concerning the disease, and when the apothecary, pointing to his own head, said, "'It lies all here,' the doctor, turning to Sir Lancelot, replied, "'If that be all, there's nothing in it.' Upon a more particular inquiry about the symptoms, he was told that the blood was seemingly viscous, and salt upon the tongue, the urine remarkably acrosaline, and the faeces atrabilious and fetid. When the doctor said he would engage to find the same phenomena in every healthy man of the three kingdoms, the apothecary added that the patient was manifestly comatose, and moreover afflicted with griping pains and borborigmata. A fit for your borborigmata, cried the physician. What has been done? To this question he replied that venisection had been three times performed, that a vesicatory had been applied into scapulars, 
that the patient had taken occasionally of a cathartic aposum, and between whiles, alexipharmic boluses and neutral draughts. Neutral, indeed, said the doctor. So neutral that I'll be crucified if ever they declare either for the patient or the disease. So saying, he brushed into Crabshaw's chamber, followed by our adventurer, who was almost suffocated at his first entrance. The day was close, the window shutters were fastened, a huge fire blazed in the chimney, thick harateen curtains were close drawn round the bed, where the wretched squire lay extended under an enormous load of blankets. The nurse, who had all the exteriors of a board given to drink, sat stewing in this apartment, like a damned soul in some infernal bagno, but rising when the company entered, made her curtsies with great decorum. Well, said the doctor, how does your patient, nurse? Blessed be God for it, I hope in a fair way. To be sure, his opposum has had a blessed effect, five and twenty stools since three o'clock in the morning. But then, this would not suffer the blisters to be put upon his thighs. Good lack, and has been mortally obstropolous and out of his senses all this blessed day. You lie, cried the squire. I ain't out of my seven senses, though I'm half mad with vexation. The doctor, having withdrawn the curtain, the hapless squire appeared, very pale and ghastly, and having surveyed his master with a rueful aspect, addressed him in these words. Sir Knight, I beg a boon, be pleased to tie a stone about the neck of the apothecary, and a halter about the neck of the nurse, and throw the one into the next river, and the other over the next tree, and in doing so you will do a charitable deed to your fellow creatures for he and she do the devil's work in partnership, and have sent many a score of their betters home to him before their time. Oh, he begins to talk sensibly. Have a good heart, said the physician. What is your disorder? Physic. What do you chiefly complain of? The doctor. Does your head ache? Yea, with impertinence. Have you a pain in your back? Yes, where the blister lies. Are you sick at stomach? Yes, with hunger. Do you feel any shivering? Always at sight of the apothecary. Do you perceive any load in your bowels? I would the apothecary's conscience was as clear. Are you thirsty? Not thirsty enough to drink barley water. Be pleased to look into his forces, said the apothecary. He has got a rough tongue and a very foul mouth, I'll assure you. I have known that the case with some limbs of the faculty, where they stood more in need of correction than of physic. Well, my honest friend, since you have already undergone the proper purgations in due form, and say you have no other disease than the doctor, we will set you on your legs again without further question. Here, nurse, open that window and throw these files into the street. Now lower the curtain, without shutting the casement, that the man may not be stifled in his own steam. In the next place, take off two-thirds of these coals, and one-third of these blankets. How dost thou feel now, my heart? I should feel heart whole, if so be as you would throw the nurse o'er the bottles, and the apothecary out of the nurse, and order me a pound of chops for my dinner, for I be so hungry. I could eat a horse behind the saddle. The apothecary, seeing what passed, retired of his own accord, holding up his hands in sign of astonishment. The nurse was dismissed in the same breath. Crabshaw rose, dressed himself without assistance, and made a hearty meal on the first eatable that presented itself to view. The night passed the evening with the physician, who, from his first appearance, concluded he was mad, but, in the course of the conversation, found means to resign that opinion without adopting any other in lieu of it, and parted with him under all the impatience of curiosity. The knight, on his part, was very well entertained with the witty sarcasms and erudition of the doctor, who appeared to be a sort of cynic philosopher, tinctured with misanthropy, 
and at open war with the whole body of apothecaries, whom, however, it was by no means his interest to disoblige. Next day, Crabshaw, being to all appearance perfectly recovered, our adventurer reckoned with the apothecary, paid the landlord, and set out on his return for the London road, resolving to lay aside his armour at some distance from the metropolis, for, ever since his interview with Aurelia, his fondness for chivalry had been gradually abating. As the torrent of his despair had disordered the current of his sober reflection, so now, as that despair subsided, his thoughts began to flow deliberately in their ancient channel. All day long he regaled his imagination with plans of connubial happiness, formed on the possession of the incomparable Aurelia, determined to wait with patience until the law should supersede the authority of her guardian, rather than adopt any violent expedient which might hazard the interests of his passion. He had for some time travelled in the turnpike road, when his reverie was suddenly interrupted by a confused noise, and when he lifted up his eyes, he beheld at a little distance a rabble of men and women, variously armed with flails, pitchforks, poles, and muskets, actingly offensively against a strange figure on horseback, who, with a kind of lance, laid about him with incredible fury. Our adventurer was not so totally abandoned by the spirit of chivalry, to see without emotion a single knight in danger of being overpowered by such a multitude of adversaries. Without staying to put on his helmet, he ordered Crabshaw to follow him in the charge against those plebeians. Then, couching his glance and giving Bronzamati the spur, he began his career with such impetuosity as overturned all that happened to be in his way, and intimidated the rabble to such a degree that they retired before him like a flock of sheep, the greater part of them believing he was the devil in propria persona. He came in the very nick of time to save the life of the other errant, against whom three loaded muskets were actually levelled at the very instant that our adventurer began his charge. The unknown knight was so sensible of the seasonable interposition that, riding up to our hero, Brother, said he, this is the second time you have holped me off when I was bump ashore. Bez mizzen, I must say, is no more than a leaky bumboat in comparison of the glorious galley you want to man. I desire that henceforth we may cruise in the same latitudes, brother, and I'll be damned if I don't stand by you as long as I have a stick standing or can carry a rag of canvas. By this address our knight recognised the novice Captain Crow who had found means to accommodate himself with a very strange suit of armour. By way of helmet, he wore one of the caps used by the light horse, with straps buckled under his chin, and contrived in such a manner as to conceal his whole visage except the eyes. Instead of cuirass, mail, greaves, and other pieces of complete armour, he was cased in a postillion's leathern jerkin, covered with thin plates of tinned iron, his buckler was a pot-lid, his lance a hop-pole, shod with iron, and a basket-hilt broadsword, like that of Hudibras, depended by a broad buff belt that girded his middle. His feet were defended by jack-boots, and his hands by the gloves of a trooper. Sir Lancelot would not lose time in examining particulars, as he had perceived some mischief had been done, and that the enemy had rallied at a distance. He therefore commanded Crow to follow him, and rode off with great expedition. But he did not perceive his squire was taken prisoner, nor did the captain recollect that his nephew, Tom Clark, had been disabled and secured in the beginning of the fray. The truth is, the poor captain had been so belaboured about the pate, that it was a wonder he remembered his own name. End of chapter 16 Chapter 17 of The Life and Adventures of Sir Lancelot Greaves. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit 
librivox.org recording by jennifer painter the life and adventures of sir lancelot greaves by tobias smollett chapter 17 containing adventures of chivalry equally new and surprising the knight sir lancelot and the novice crow retreated with equal order and expedition to the distance of half a league from the field of battle where the former halting proposed to make a lodgment in a very decent house of entertainment distinguished by the sign of st george of cappadocia encountering the dragon an achievement in which temporal and spiritual chivalry were happily reconciled two such figures alighting at the inn gate did not pass through the yard unnoticed and unadmired by the guests and attendants some of whom fairly took to their heels on the supposition that these outlandish creatures were the avant couriers or heralds of a french invasion the fears and doubts however of those who ventured to stay were soon dispelled when our hero accosted them in the english tongue and with the most courteous demeanour desired to be shown into an apartment had captain crow been spokesman perhaps their suspicions would not have so quickly subsided for he was in reality a very extraordinary novice not only in chivalry but also in his external appearance and particularly in those dialects of the english language which are used by the terrestrial animals of this kingdom he desired the ostler to take his horse in tow and bring him to his moorings in a safe riding he ordered the waiter who showed them into a parlour to bear a hand ship his oars mind his helm and bring alongside a short allowance of brandy or grog that he might canter slug into his bedroom for there was such a heaving and pitching that he believed he should shift his ballast the fellow understood no part of this address but the word brandy at mention of which he disappeared then crow throwing himself into an elbow chair stop my oars oles cried he i can't think what's the matter brother but egad my head sings and simmers like a pot of chowder my eyesight yours too and again d'ye see then there's such a walloping and whooshing in my hold smite me lord have mercy upon us here you swab ne'er mind the glass hand me the noggin the latter part of this address was directed to the waiter who had returned with a quartern of brandy which crow snatching eagerly started into his bedroom at one cant indeed there was no time to be lost inasmuch as he seemed to be on the verge of fainting away when he swallowed this cordial by which he was instantaneously revived he then desired the servant to unbuckle the straps of his helmet but this was a task which the drawer could not perform even though assisted with the good offices of sir lancelot for the head and jaws were so much swelled with the discipline they had undergone that the straps and buckles lay buried as it were in pits formed by the tumefaction of the adjacent parts fortunately for the novice a neighbouring surgeon passed by the door on horseback a circumstance which the waiter who saw him from the window no sooner disclosed than the knight had recourse to his assistance this practitioner having viewed the whole figure and more particularly the head of crow in silent wonder proceeded to feel his pulse and then declared that as the inflammation was very great and going on with violence to its acme it would be necessary to begin with copious phlebotomy and then to empty the intestinal canal so saying he began to strip the arm of the captain who perceiving his aim avast brother cried he you go the wrong way to work you may as well rummage the afterhold when the damage is in the forecastle i shall write again when my jaws are unhooped with these words he drew a clasp knife from his pocket and advancing to a glass applied it so vigorously to the leathern straps of his headpiece that the gordian knot was cut 
without any other damage to his face than a moderate scarification which added to the tumefaction of features naturally strong and a whole week's growth of a very bushy beard produced on the whole a most hideous caricature after all there was a necessity for the administration of the surgeon who found divers contusions on different parts of the skull which even the tin cap had not been able to protect from the weapons of the rustics these being shaved and dressed secundum artem and the operator dismissed with a proper acknowledgment our knight detached one of the post-boys to the field of action for intelligence concerning mr clark and squire timothy and in the interim desired to know the particulars of crow's adventures since he parted from him at the white hart a connected relation in plain english was what he had little reason to expect from the novice who nevertheless exerted his faculties to the uttermost for his satisfaction he give him to understand that in steering his course to birmingham where he thought of fitting himself with tackle he had fallen in by accident at a public house with an itinerant tinker in the very act of mending a kettle that seeing him do his business like an able workman he had applied to him for advice and the tinker after having considered the subject had undertaken to make him such a suit of armour as neither sword nor lance should penetrate that they adjourned to the next town where the leather coat the plates of tinned iron the lance and the broadsword were purchased together with a copper saucepan which the artist was now at work upon in converting it to a shield but in the meantime the captain being impatient to begin his career of chivalry had accommodated himself with a pot lid and taken to the highway notwithstanding all the entreaties tears and remonstrances of his nephew tom clark who could not however be prevailed upon to leave him in the dangerous voyage he had undertaken that this being but the second day of his journey he descried five or six men on horseback bearing up full in his teeth upon which he threw his sails aback and prepared for action that he hailed them at a considerable distance and bade them bring to when they came alongside notwithstanding his hail he ordered them to clue up their courses and furl their topsails otherwise he would be foul of their quarters that hearing this salute they luffed all at once till their cloth shook in the wind then he hallooed in a loud voice that his sweetheart basilia mizen were the broad pendant of beauty to which they must strike their topsails on pain of being sent to the bottom that after having eyed him for some time with astonishment they clapped on all their sails some of them running under his stern and others athwart his forefoot and got clear off that not satisfied with running ahead they all of a sudden tacked about and one of them boarding him on the lee quarter gave him such a drubbing about his upper works that the lights danced in his lanterns that he returned his salute with his hop pole so effectually that his aggressor broached too in the twinkling of a handspike and then he was engaged with all the rest of the enemy except one who sheered off and soon returned with a mosquito fleet of small craft who had done him considerable damage and in all probability would have made prize of him hadn't he been brought off by the knight's gallantry he said that in the beginning of the conflict tom clark rode up to the foremost of the enemy as he did suppose in order to prevent hostilities but before he got up to him near enough to hold discourse he was pooped with a sea that almost sent him to the bottom and then towed off he knew not whither crow had scarce finished his narration which consisted of broken hints and unconnected explosions of sea terms when a gentleman of the neighbourhood who acted in the commission of the peace arrived at the gate attended by a constable who had in custody the bodies of thomas clark 
and timothy crabshaw surrounded by five men on horseback and an innumerable posse of men women and children on foot the captain who always kept a good lookout no sooner descried this cavalcade and procession than he gave notice to sir lancelot and advised they should crowd away with all the cloth they could carry our adventurer was of another opinion and determined at any rate to procure the enlargement of the prisoners the justice ordering his attendants to stay without the gate sent his compliments to sir lancelot greaves and desired to speak with him for a few minutes he was immediately admitted and could not help staring at sight of crow who by this time had no remains of the human physiognomy so much was the swelling increased and the skin discoloured the gentleman whose name was mr elmy having made a polite apology for the liberty he had taken proceeded to unfold his business he said information had been lodged with him as a justice of the peace against two armed men on horseback who had stopped five farmers on the king's highway put them in fear and danger of their lives and even assaulted maimed and wounded divers persons contrary to the king's peace and in violation of the statute that by the description he supposed the knight and his companion to be the persons against whom the complaint had been lodged and understanding his quality from mr clark whom he had known in london he was come to wait upon him and if possible effect an accommodation our adventurer having thanked him for the polite and obliging manner in which he proceeded frankly told him the whole story as it had been just related by the captain and mr elmy had no reason to doubt the truth of the narrative as it confirmed every circumstance which clark had before reported indeed tom had been very communicative to this gentleman and made him acquainted with the whole history of sir lancelot greaves as well as with the whimsical resolution of his uncle captain crow mr elmy now told the knight that the persons whom the captain had stopped were farmers returning from a neighbouring market a set of people naturally boorish and at that time elevated with ale to an uncommon pitch of insolence that one of them in particular called prickle was the most quarrelsome fellow in the whole county and so litigious that he had maintained above thirty lawsuits in eight and twenty of which he had been condemned in costs he said the others might be easily influenced in the way of admonition but there was no way of dealing with prickle except by the form and authority of the law he therefore proposed to hear evidence in a judicial capacity and his clerk being in attendance the court was immediately opened in the knight's apartment by this time mr clerk had made such good use of his time in explaining the law to his audience and displaying the great wealth and unbounded liberality of sir lancelot greaves that he had actually brought over to his sentiments the constable and the commonality tag rag and bobtail and even staggered the majority of the farmers who at first had breathed nothing but defiance and revenge farmer stake being first called to the bar and sworn touching the identity of sir lancelot greaves and captain crow declared that the said crow had stopped him on the king's highway and put him in bodily fear that he afterwards saw the said crow with a pole or weapon value threepence breaking the king's peace by committing assault and battery against the heads and shoulders of his majesty's liege subjects geoffrey prickle hodge dolt richard bumpkin mary fang catherine rubble and marjorie litter and that he saw sir lancelot greaves baronet aiding assisting and comforting the said crow contrary to the king's peace and against the form of the statute being asked if the defendant when he stopped them demanded their money or threatened violence he answered he could not say 
inasmuch as the defendant spoke in an unknown language. Being interrogated if the defendant did not allow them to pass without using any violence, and if they did not pass unmolested, the deponent replied in the affirmative. Being required to tell for what reason they returned, and if the defendant Crow was not assaulted before he began to use his weapon, the deponent made no answer. The depositions of Farmer Bumpkin and Muggins, as well as of Madge Litter and Mary Fang, were taken to much the same purpose, and his worship earnestly exhorted them to an accommodation, observing that they themselves were in fact the aggressors, and that Captain Crow had done no more than exerted himself in his own defence. They were all pretty well disposed to follow his advice, except Farmer Prickle, who, entering the court with a bloody handkerchief about his head, declared that the law should determine it at next size, and in the meantime insisted that the defendants should find immediate bail, or go to prison, or be set in the stocks. He affirmed that they had been guilty of an affray, in appearing in armour and weapons not usually worn, to the terror of others, which is in itself a breach of the peace. But they had, moreover, with force of arms, that is to say, with swords, staves, and other warlike instruments, by turns made an assault and a fray to the terror and disturbance of him and divers subjects of our lord the king, then and there being, and to the evil and pernicious example of the liege people of the said lord the king, and against the peace of our said lord the king, his crown and dignity. The peasant had purchased a few law terms at a considerable expense, and he thought he had a right to turn his knowledge to the annoyance of all his neighbours. Mr. Elmy, finding him obstinately deaf to all proposals of accommodation, held the defendants to very moderate bail, the landlord and the curate of the parish freely offering themselves as sureties. Mr. Clark, with Timothy Crabshaw, against whom nothing appeared, were now set at liberty. When the former, advancing to his worship, gave information against Geoffrey Prickle, and declared upon oath that he had seen him assault Captain Crow without any provocation, and when he, the deponent, interposed to prevent further mischief, the said Prickle had likewise assaulted and wounded him, the deponent, and detained him for some time in false imprisonment, without warrant or authority. In consequence of this information, which was corroborated by diverse evidences, selected from the mob at the gate, the tables were turned upon Farmer Prickle, who was given to understand that he must either find bail or be forthwith imprisoned. This honest boar, who was in opulent circumstances, had made such popular use of the benefits he possessed that there was not a housekeeper in the parish who would not have rejoiced to see him hanged. His dealings and connections, however, were such that none of the other four would have refused to bail him, had not Clark given them to understand that, if they did, he would make them all principals and parties, and have two separate actions against each. Prickle happened to be at variance with the innkeeper, and the curate durst not disoblige the vicar, who at that very time was suing the farmer for the small tithes. He offered to deposit a sum equal to the recognizance of the knight's bail, but this was rejected as an expedient contrary to the practice of the courts. He sent for the attorney of the village, to whom he had been a good customer, but the lawyer was hunting evidence in another county. The excise man presented himself as a surety, but he, not being a housekeeper, was not accepted. Divers cottagers, who depended on Farmer Prickle, were successively refused, because they could not prove that they had paid Scot and Lot and parish taxes. The farmer, finding himself thus forlorn, and in imminent danger of visiting the inside of a prison, was seized with a paroxysm of rage, during which he inveighed against the bench, 
reviled the two adventurers errant declared that he believed and would lay a wager of twenty guineas that he had more money in his pocket than e'er a man in the company and in the space of a quarter of an hour swore forty oaths which the justice did not fail to number before we proceed to other matters said mr elmy i order you to pay forty shillings for the oaths you have sworn otherwise i will cause you to be set in the stocks without further ceremony prickle throwing down a couple of guineas with two execrations more to make up the sum declared that he could afford to pay for swearing as well as e'er a justice in the county and repeated his challenge of the wager which our adventurer now accepted protesting at the same time that it was not a step taken from any motive of pride but entirely with a view to punish an insolent plebeian who could not otherwise be chastised without a breach of the peace twenty guineas being deposited on each side in the hands of mr elmy prickle with equal confidence and dispatch produced a canvas bag containing two hundred and seventy pounds which being spread upon the table made a very formidable show that dazzled the eyes of the beholders and induced many of them to believe he had ensured his conquest our adventurer asking if he had anything further to offer and being answered in the negative drew forth with great deliberation a pocket-book in which there was a considerable parcel of bank-notes from which he selected three of one hundred pounds each and exhibited them upon the table to the astonishment of all present prickle mad with his overthrow and loss said it might be necessary to make him prove the notes were honestly come by and sir launcelot started up in order to take vengeance upon him for this insult but was withheld by the arms and remonstrances of mr elmy who assured him that prickle desired nothing so much as another broken head to lay the foundation of a new prosecution the knight calmed by this interposition turned to the audience saying with the most affable deportment good people do not imagine that i intend to pocket the spoils of such a contemptible rascal i shall beg the favour of this worthy gentleman to take up these twenty guineas and distribute them as he shall think proper among the poor of the parish but by this benefaction i do not hold myself acquitted for the share i had in the bruises some of you have received in this unlucky fray and therefore i give the other twenty guineas to be divided among the sufferers to each according to the damage he or she shall appear to have sustained and i shall consider it as an additional obligation if mr elmy will likewise superintend this retribution at the close of this address the whole yard and gateway rung with acclamation while honest crow whose generosity was not inferior even to that of the accomplished greaves pulled out his purse and declared that as he had begun the engagement he would at least go share and share alike in new caulking their seams and repairing their timbers the knight rather than enter into a dispute with his novice told him he considered the twenty guineas as given by them both in conjunction and that they would confer together on that subject hereafter this point being adjusted mr elmy assumed all the solemnity of the magistrate and addressed himself to prickle in these words father prickle i am both sorry and ashamed to see a man of your years and circumstances so little respected that you cannot find sufficient bail for forty pounds a sure testimony that you have neither cultivated the friendship nor deserved the good will of your neighbours i have heard of your quarrels and your riots your insolence and litigious disposition and often wished for an opportunity of giving you a proper taste of the law's correction that opportunity now offers you have in the hearing of all these people poured forth a torrent of abuse against me both in the character of a gentleman and of a magistrate 
you're abusing me personally perhaps i should have overlooked with the contempt it deserves but i should ill vindicate the dignity of my office as a magistrate by suffering you to insult the bench with impunity i shall therefore imprison you for contempt and you shall remain in jail until you can find bail on the other prosecutions prickle the first transports of his anger having subsided began to be pricked with the thorns of compunction he was indeed extremely mortified at the prospect of being sent to jail so disgracefully his countenance fell and after a hard internal struggle while the clerk was employed in writing the mittimus he said he hoped his worship would not send him to prison he begged pardon of him and our adventurers for having abused them in his passion and observed that as he had received a broken head and paid two and twenty guineas for his folly he could not be said to have escaped altogether without punishment even if the plaintiff should agree to exchange releases sir lancelot seeing this stubborn rustic effectually humbled became an advocate in his favour with mr elmy and tom clark who forgave him at his request and a mutual release being executed the farmer was permitted to depart the populace were regaled at our adventurer's expense and the men women and children who had been wounded or bruised in the battle to the number of ten or a dozen were desired to wait upon mr elmy in the morning to receive the knight's bounty the justice was prevailed upon to spend the evening with sir lancelot and his two companions for whom supper was bespoke but the first thing the cook prepared was a poultice for crow's head which was now enlarged to a monstrous exhibition our knight who was all kindness and complacency shook mr clark by the hand expressing his satisfaction at meeting with his old friends again and told him softly that he had compliments for him from mrs dolly cowslip who now lived with his aurelia clark was confounded at this intelligence and after some hesitation lord bless my soul cried he i'll be shot then if the pretended miss meadows wasn't the same as miss darnell he then declared himself extremely glad that poor dolly had got into such an agreeable situation passed many warm encomiums on her goodness of heart and virtuous inclinations and concluded with appealing to the knight whether she did not look very pretty in her green joseph in the meantime he procured a plaster for his own head and helped to apply the poultice to that of his uncle who was sent to bed betimes with a moderate dose of sack whey to promote perspiration the other three passed the evening to their mutual satisfaction and the justice in particular grew enamoured of the knight's character dashed as it was with extravagance let us now leave them to the enjoyment of a sober and rational conversation and give some account of other guests who arrived late in the evening and here fixed their night quarters but as we have already trespassed on the reader's patience we shall give him a short respite until the next chapter makes its appearance end of chapter 17